Well, good evening, everyone. Always thankful for the opportunities that I have. Always thankful for those that step up and serve in and, and whatever way that they can. Jeff and I kind of coordinated, I guess, with song titles. <laughs> I didn't realize that until I texted Jeff my lesson, then, and then he made the connection. But uh, the title of the lesson this evening is, Where is the Love? Where is the Love? Uh, my last lesson was... Uh, is God a lover or a hater? And we kind of explored that a little bit. And sometimes when you, when you preach and you drill hole your, uh, home your point as best you can, what, what you do is it, sometimes people get the impression that you're swaying to one side. And certainly I don't want to leave you with the impression that Christians should be swayed to the hate side only in respect to things that God hates. There are certain things that God hates. He has a disgust for. He does not approve of. And certainly as Christians trying to align our life with his word, we should, we should hate evil, those things that God hates. And certainly that limits itself to evil, not necessarily individuals. But I think sometimes people do look at Christianity in our society and they're starting to ask questions. Of course, questions coming from different angles and different respects. But I think this is one question that is, that is starting to be aimed at Christianity. Where is the love? Where is the love in Christianity? And I think there's so many places that we could point. And that's what we're going to explore this evening. But I think how we have to view it and have, how we have to look at it is, are we exhibiting the love of the Bible? The love that God wants us to have for our fellow man. The love that God expressed really towards us in giving his son as a sacrifice for us. Are we expressing the love of the Bible? You know, it's interesting when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, rather, that passage that was just read for us, you know, it lays out this picture of love that's oftentimes read at weddings and, and events such as that. But what's interesting is the way that the world defines love. See, the world defines love as sometimes something that can fade. Sometimes the world defines love as, as something that you can do when you want to. Sometimes the world defines love as something that you do when it's easy, but when it's hard, you just give it up. It's interesting, the perception of love throughout our society, but I think sometimes people will point the finger at Christianity and say, where is the love in this area? And certainly we want to make sure that we are exhibiting the characteristics and the traits that God wants us to have. The first area that I think sometimes people on the outside of Christianity look at us and and they ask the question, where is love, is in relation to our brethren. And that's the first one I would like to explore this evening. Where is the love in relation to our brethren? Do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ the way we should? Or is that question accurate? Where, where is the love? Where is the love that Christians have for brothers and sisters in Christ? See, love isn't always easy. And love, when we really look at the love of the Bible, it's extended even when it's hard. And the love of the Bible cannot fade. When we start looking at the picture that God lays out for love in relation to our brothers and sisters in Christ, what we see is it is a command, a requirement, a given, a must. But do we look at ourselves every once in a while as brothers and sisters in Christ and say, where is the love? Certainly that's an idea that the Bible reinforces over and over again, that brothers and sisters in Christ should have a healthy love for one another. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? Or is the charge that's given to Christianity sometimes, where is the love for your brothers and sisters? Is that valid? Or are we expressing the love the way we should towards our brothers and sisters in Christ? Because the Bible is very clear that there should be a love between brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 21 says, This command we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. See, this love that we're supposed to have for brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not a maybe. It's, it's not a, a if. It's not one of these, well, you can if you feel like it or if it's easy. It's a love that's there consistently. It's a love that's long-suffering. It's a love that's there. Where is the love for our brethren? Can it be found or is it non-existent? 
Is it slowly disappearing, slowly dissipating? Is it still there, the love that the Bible wants us to have for our brothers and sisters in Christ? We could go through Bible verse after Bible verse. This idea is emphasized and pushed, but do we emphasize and push it in the Lord's church? That we love one another, that we have a sincere love of the brethren, that we love each other fervently with a pure heart, that we follow what it says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 21, when it says God says, you must love your brother also. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, it says, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him, but he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? John chapter 13 and verse 34, A new command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Do we understand that there has to be a love between brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we understand without that foundational principle, all the relationships we have in Christ fall apart? See, there's so many other things that the Bible wants us to do. The Bible wants us to do work in relation to the churches and growing the kingdom, extending the borders of the kingdom. There's so much work for us to do. The Bible pleads again. Jesus pleads again. Jesus prays that we be unified. But the only way that that is going to be able to be sustained and maintained is through the love we have for one another. The relationship that we have with one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, the only way we can move forward with our relationship with God and our relationship with one another upon this earth is if it has the foundation of love. Without love, it will all break apart. It will all crumble. Because you know what? There's so many trials and tribulations that we go through. There's so many things that we have to face together as the body of Christ that if we don't love one another... If we don't have that sincere love for one another, we won't make it together. We can see the plea for unity over and over again throughout the New Testament. And the only way we can answer that call to unity is if we truly love one another and we're willing to work through our differences, our shortcomings, the mistakes we make, the hardships we go through, the trials that we have, the persecutions that we face together. The only way we can do that is if love is present. That's Paul's plea to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. He's pleading with them. He says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. How is that going to be achieved? It's not going to be achieved without love. How are we going to come to the same conclusions? How are we going to have the same mind? How are we going to be perfectly joined together if we don't love one another, if we don't care for one another? How are we going to move forward through the hard times, the trials, all these things, if we don't have that foundation of love? You know, I really believe it takes a lot of love to be unified through all the ups and downs of this life. It takes a lot of love to keep the church unified through all the ups and downs and the trials and the persecutions throughout this life. It takes a lot of love. We need love to maintain unity. The unity that's desired in the Bible. And one of the most amazing things of the church is we all come from such different backgrounds. We all have a story. We all have uh, our story of leading to our conversion and becoming Christians. And for some of us, it meant leaving our families. For some of us, it meant leaving our homes. Uh, I mean, there's so many different situations we could go through over and over again. We all have a story. We all have a backstory. We all have the life and the things that have happened to us throughout this life. And what's the thing that holds all these different backgrounds together, all these different people, all these different personalities, all these different things? The love that we have for one another in Jesus Christ. What else could hold such a diverse group of people together? As I've traveled around and preached at different congregations and things, that commonality of loving Christ and loving each other is what gets us through. 
We don't always agree on every point. We don't always see eye to eye on everything. But because we love each other, because we care for one another, we can work through these things and work through all the things that happen to us throughout this life, keeping and understanding the unity, the goal that the Bible sets forward because we have a love for one another. Is the love present where it should be between our brothers and sisters in Christ? Jesus prays for unity in John chapter 17. He prays for it. He's pleading for it. He says, I want them to be unified. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 through 21, it says, We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this command we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. Do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? It's an idea that's emphasized and pushed over and over again, but do we push it among ourselves? Do we encourage it as we travel and see our other brothers and sisters in Christ at congregations meeting and worshiping the Lord? Do we encourage it? Do we check in on our brothers and sisters in Christ and other congregations? Of course, there's so many things that are important at the local congregation, which which we are members of, which we have committed our time to. But do we have a love for all the brethren, all our brothers and sisters in Christ? In 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, it said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this... The love of God was manifest towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I find it interesting where the bond that we should have as brothers and sisters in Christ, as followers of Christ, it should be one of the strongest bonds that we have. And I believe for many of us it is. But it's unfortunate when it becomes not as important. When the bond between brothers and sisters in Christ isn't important, and the bond of love, the bonds that hold us, the the unity and all those things start to sever, the strongest relationship that we should have on this planet in many respects, should be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's sad when so many times it's corrupted because the love is lost. It should be one of the relationships upon this earth that has the most love, and yet sometimes, somehow, it develops into one of the relationships where sometimes people find the most hatred. It should be one of those places where there should be the most forgiveness, but yet sometimes we find that it's one of the places of unforgiveness. It should be one of the places where there should be the most understanding. But it seems like sometimes it slips into misunderstanding. It should be one of the places where there is the most caring and consideration. And yet sometimes it becomes just the opposite. Do we really have the love that God wants us to have? When other people in the community see brothers and sisters in Christ, when they, when they look at Sandyville Church of Christ... What do they see? Do they see the love? Or do they ask, where is the love? Do they have a love for one another? Are they concerned about each other? Are they caring about one another? Are they looking out after one another? What is their perception? What do they see? Because some in the world look at the church from time to time and they say, where is the love? Do we have love for our brothers and sisters in Christ? Certainly we should have that care. That love is so foundational that builds out into the care that we have for our brothers and sisters in Christ. In Romans chapter 12 and verse uh, 10, it says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender hearted. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, it says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, 
How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That little phrase there, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. You know, that question, where is the love? It's not just one of these things that that we can't measure, that's, that's subjective. When we look here in 1 John chapter 3, it says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. It's this idea that we can see the love. It's manifested. We can see a physical manifestation of the love for one another by the way that we treat one another, by the way that we handle one another, the way that we handle disagreements, misunderstandings, the way we handle each other when we see each other in public. Do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we loving our brethren the way that the Bible wants us to? Do we, in some degree by our actions, eliminate that question of the world coming at us? I don't think the world should be able to, phase, should be able to ask that question towards us because they should, they should already know the answer. Where is your love for the brethren? They should see it. They should know it by the way we conduct ourselves, by the way we care for one another, by the way that we're unified, the way we handle each other day in and day out. Where is the love in relation to our conduct with our brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, I think many times that's, that's a challenge all into itself. Loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. But you know what? God, he gives us a challenge that goes way farther than just loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a challenge on our hands that far exceeds loving those, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who hold the same principles, values, ideas. The Bible extends way beyond that. Where does the Bible extend? It says, love your enemies. Where is the love for our enemies? Is that love existent? Is it there? Is it present? Or has it been lost? Where is the love for our enemy? Certainly that's something that the Bible lays out. So easy to forget when we're trying to, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, try to love our family the way we should. Do we forget to love our enemies? Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 through 48. It says, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only... What do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. See, the Christian love does not necessarily extend all places. The Christian love does not necessarily extend all places at all times, but there are places that the Bible tells us that our love should be going. Our love should be going to our brethren. Our love should be going to our enemies. Is your love going to those places? Or do people look at the way you conduct your life and say, where is the love in their life? I can't find it. I can't see it. Where is it? In Romans chapter 12, and verse 14, it says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Certainly there's challenges throughout the Christian life. In Romans chapter 12, and verse 20, it says, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you heap coals of fire on his head. Do we understand that the foundation of Christianity is love? The only way we're going to maintain unity is with love. The only way that we are going to take on any Christian trade or quality is, is with that foundation and base of love. I think that's what's laid out in Romans chapter 13. The idea that's trying to be expressed here is that without love, everything else is going to fail. Without love, without that foundation, everything else is going to fail. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10 says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other command, are all summed up in the same, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, not ha does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now certainly as we go throughout this life, I'm not saying that we can have a perfect love. 
that we are going to be perfect in every situation at all times. We're going to fall short again and again and again. But what's your goal? What are you striving for? Are you trying to love the way that the Bible expresses? And do you understand that without love, that foundational quality, nothing else is going to be accomplished? There's not going to be unity without love. You're not going to be growing without love. Without love, there are no pathways to Jesus. There are no pathways to heaven without it. Do you understand that love is the prerequisite to all Christian traits and all Christian qualities and all Christian actions? Without that foundational point, everything else stops. You know, I find it interesting that as we transition from loving brethren to loving our enemies, I find it interesting sometimes how we have this interesting dynamic where we're more willing to forgive a stranger than we are someone that we know. You know, I'm more willing to forgive this person that wronged me in some way on the street than, than to forgive my brother and sister in Christ. It's just interesting sometimes how the dynamics work. And sometimes people look and say, where is the love? You can forgive the stranger on the street, but you can't forgive your brother and sisters in Christ? Sometimes it makes you sit and contemplate. Where is the love? Are we exhibiting the love of the Bible in the way it should be used, the way it should be utilized in our relationship to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but in relationship to the people of the world, even our enemies? Those who are saying things falsely against us, those things that are people that are saying evil against us, does our love extend there? Or do we say, no, that's where I'm going to stop, that's where I'm going to cut off the love? No, God says that our love is supposed to go into all these areas, but do we cut it off? Do we make the decision and say, no, my love is not going to go to there? My love's not going to go to there. My love's not going to go to that person because of what they've done. Where is the love? Where does God tell us to extend our love out into the world? We see that it's to our brethren and to even our enemies, to our fellow man as we go throughout this life. And once again, we see that love is the foundation. Are you going to forgive someone if you don't love them? Love them in terms of the Bible. I mean, Ephesians chapter 4, verse uh, 32, it says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. We understand that love is the foundational thing that drives our life, drives our actions, drives our chance at being with God in heaven one day. The sacrifice that Jesus had for us was driven out of love. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, it says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Are we considering the things that we should consider? Are we looking around into the world and looking for opportunities to do what's right and good? Are we driven out of love? Or are we really defining our love by the way that the world defines it? Well, you can love if it's easy for you. You can love for a period of time, but then you can stop loving. You know, you can fall out of love. That's okay. Is that the love that the Bible is really expressing? A love that fades? A love that gives up? A love that, that's only in the easy times? Is that the love that we see? Or do we see a long-suffering love that's there continually? Are we loving our enemies? One of the things that I find interesting is that sometimes we get stuff so reversed when it comes to God's word. We will almost say the exact opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible will say, here is the only reason to divorce, and then we say the exact opposite. Or we can turn to any subject in the Bible. I mean, absolutely any subject in the Bible, and we can find an example where the Bible very clearly lays out its expectations. God clearly writes out what he expects of us. And we do the exact opposite. You know, Christian love is a beautiful thing. It's to be extended to our brethren, even to our enemies. But you know, the Christian love does not extend to everything. But what I find interesting is we flip-flop it. We say, you know what? I, I, I don't know if I'm going to love my brethren. I don't know if I'm going to love my enemies. But you know what I am going to love? Exactly what the Bible tells us not to love. What does the Bible tell us not to love? Well, Roman, uh, James chapter 4 and verse 4, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 
Well, that doesn't really say love there. I was talking about friendship. That's not close enough for you. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of the Father abides forever. It's interesting how we flip-flop stuff. You know what, Kyle? I, I don't know. Loving, this, loving my brother and, I, and my, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't know if I'm up to that. You know what? Loving my enemies, I don't know if I'm up to that. And to some degree, I understand that we're all not up to that challenge, that we're all going to fall short, that we're all going to make mistakes. I understand that. I'm not proposing that we can live a perfect life. But what I am proposing is, is what are you striving for? What are you shooting for? What are you after? But so many times... When it comes to God's word, we do the exact opposite. I'm not going to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not going to love my enemies, but you know what I am going to love? I'm going to love the world. Of course, that's not the people's internal dialogue. That's not what they're really saying. Of course, no one will really say, oh, of course, I'm I'm loving my brothers and sisters in Christ. Of course, I'm loving my enemies. That's not their internal dialogue. But then the question is, where is the love? Can you find it? Can you see it? And sometimes when you examine your own life, perhaps you find yourself leaning a little bit more towards your love, going towards materialism and those type of things. Is that where you're being leaded? Where does your love really go? Are you following your love? Are you following your actions? Are you following your care? Are you following those things and seeing where they lead? Where do they lead? Does your love lead to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Does your love lead to your enemies? Or does your love seem to lead to the world more often than not? Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. What do you love? Where is your time? Where is your care? Where is your consideration? Where are your thoughts? Where do they go? Do they go to your brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, I think prayer is so so very, very important. I think sometimes we, we don't consider the aspects of prayer. A lot of times we'll look at communion, and, and we'll look at communion, and we'll say, oh, well, communion is a great thing. Well, why, why is it great? And we kind of say, well, well, you know what? God put communion there so we can remember, you know. It's a remembering thing, and we know how forgetful we are. Well, why did God institute prayer? I mean, I know prayer is powerful, but besides that, when you pray, what are you focusing yourself on? You know, when you think about prayer, prayer is a meditation on those things that are good. When you read Philippians, and it it tells us to focus on these things, when you rattle down that list of the things it tells us to focus our minds on, and you think about praying, that's what your mind's focused on. When you pray, a lot of times you're focused on your brothers and sisters in Christ. A lot of times when you pray, you're even praying for your enemies, those that that have different ideologies than us that we're trying to persuade to, to the cause of Christ to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Prayer is a wonderful thing because it helps us to focus, I think, a lot of times our love. Our love is a lot of times focused on the youth. Our love a lot of times focused on our family. Our love a lot of times is focused on our brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, you can hear it every time there's a public player uh, uh, spoken in our assembly. You You can hear the love spoken. You can feel the love that's spoken for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's so sad that a lot of times our love is directed in the wrong direction. It's directed away from our brothers and sisters in Christ and many times to the world. And it's sad because the Bible tells us that we've brought nothing into this world and we're going to take nothing out. But yet we'll dedicate all our time, all our motivation, all our thoughts to those things, those things that are passing away. And people think that they can let worldly things, they can just take a little bit, you know, I can love this worldly thing, love this worldly thing, and before they know it, it's got a hold of them, and it's, it's ripped them away from their brothers and sisters in Christ. It's, it's ripped them away from, from their relationship with God. I, you know, we say it again and again, but it's so sad because we just see it again and again and again. People ripped away from God because their love of the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. 
And people don't think it's a big deal. Just a little bit. It's okay. It's, it's not going to hurt me. It's not going to harm me. I can handle just a little bit. But I don't think that's what the Bible teaches us. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters. You're really going to try to love what the Bible says love, but on the same hand, love what the Bible says not to love. No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and manna. Are you trying to love the way that the Bible tells you to love? Are you extending your love to the places that the Bible wants you to extend your love to? And do you draw the line when the Bible says draw the line? You know, the Bible says draw the line when it comes to your love. Do not love the things of this world. Because if you do, what will happen? It will draw you away from your heavenly home. It will draw you away from Christ. It will draw you away from God. But I think there's some things that will get us closer and if, it's if we love the things that God tells us to love, when we love our brethren, it brings us closer to our heavenly home. It gives us a support system to get us to our heavenly home. When we love our enemies, we, we are reminded that we are here for a task to serve our God in heaven. Is your love extended where it should be extended? Where is your love? Where is the love? Where is your love extended? Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian tonight. God loved you. He sent his son to die for you. All of us. And without that, we wouldn't have the opportunity to be with him in heaven one day. But he did give us that chance. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to believe. Believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have to repent of your sins. Commit yourself to living a new life, turning away from the ways of the world, and trying to follow to the best of your ability the words of God. Confessing. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Jesus Christ is the Son of God and will baptize you to become a New Testament Christian. Then you live a faithful life, loving what God tells you to love and sometimes hating the things that the Bible tells us to hate and trying to live a life as best we can in service to God. Perhaps you've walked off that straight and narrow path. There'd be nothing more that we would like to do than to help you in whatever way we can. Perhaps you're subject to the invitation tonight. If you're subject, please come as we stand, as we sing.